<laughs> hello. Hello, hello and welcome everyone. Um, I'm Maria Coriel Martin. I'm the founder of Art Toolkit and I'm just so glad to be here back with our live demo series joined by Nishant Jen, the sneaky artist. I just love your work, Nishant, and really enjoyed meeting you um, not so long ago at Sketcherfest in Seattle. Yeah, hi Maria. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm so excited to draw with people and to share what I do. Oh, well, I, I love your work and we're not in such far um, different parts of the world where um, you're up in Vancouver, BC and we're just down here in Fort Townsend, other side, a little further south of the border. And um, you've just got this terrific style of ink and um, especially your figurative work. I love your where you, you in, incorporate other media as well, but you've got this background in writing and storytelling. You're also a podcaster. You really seem to just find a lot of ways to, to share and inspire people. And I'm really grateful to, to have you here today. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, it's great. It's really great to be here. Um, well, Nishant, I wonder if you could share a little bit of your background with us. Sure. Yeah. So um, I was born in, in Calcutta in India, and I grew up and I studied engineering to begin, I, I became a mechanical engineer, but I always actually just wanted to tell stories. I wanted to write stories and I wanted to be a novelist. But a lot of people of my generation in India, we went along this safe traditional path of studying science and getting, uh, trying to get a reliable job. And I went along in that path because I was good at it. I was good at math and science and I liked, I liked those things a lot. So I studied those things. And on the side, I would write stories and I would make little comics and draw them with stick figures because I really didn't know how to draw. And I made long comics just with stick figures for the longest time on the side while I did my bachelor's degree, while I did my master's degree in mechanical engineering. And at that time I lived in the Netherlands. Uh, I was studying in the Netherlands. Um, then at a certain point, I decided to make a very radical shift in my life. I realized that I really, really wanted to commit to the creative life. And I have a novel inside me that I really want to finish. So I left in the middle of a PhD program and I decided to become a writer. And I moved in with my girlfriend, who's now my wife. In uh, She was studying in the US. We moved in together and I started writing. And in the course of writing and finding the obstacles that anybody writing their first novel would strike against, like just the slog of it, to sort of refresh my mind and to just build on skills, I started walking around town with a sketchbook. And at that time, I was using my fountain pen to write with. Uh, I decided I wanted to write a little slower than I typed. So I would write with a fountain pen and make the words better somehow. Uh, but <laughs> I started doing that with uh, my drawing as well, because I had this perfectionist attitude in which I would be so unforgiving to myself. And I realized that I needed to finish lots of drawings in order to be a better artist. I needed to work through my mistakes. So I started oh, oh, drawing. That's with such, a good, such a good attitude. I just need to, everyone, we all need to embrace that, <laughs> that practice. Yes, excuse me for interrupting, but well, those words sure. are so important. <laughs> Yeah, so I started drawing with a fountain pen with the idea that I could never erase my lines. I would always have to deal with whatever I put on the page and I would only have to move forward. There is no question of undoing it or erasing it or working around it. You just have to deal with it. And that attitude was important for me to imbibe. And it led to me finishing lots of drawings, even the ones I was unhappy with. But it drilled into my mind that the solution is to turn the page and make another drawing. And just that practice of, uh, so two things combined at this time, which are so important, I think, and they've made me into an artist. I never planned to be an artist. I was only ever going to write novels that I have never finished. Uh, but I'm an artist just out of curiosity and pursuing curiosity with a sketchbook. And uh, the two things that I merged at this time that helped me build this into a sustainable habit, which is something I talk about a lot on my podcast and my newsletter as well, how to have a sustainable drawing practice that feeds your creativity, that makes you happier, that is worth your precious time. And I merged these two things, which were my curiosity and my desire to learn this specific thing and to express myself through it. Uh, my curiosity was that I was in America as an immigrant and I was just a little blown away by the whole 
Americanness of it. And I started walking around. Uh, I was in Chicago then and soon in Wisconsin. I started walking around town just to see how this incredible, bizarre place works. And uh, the sketchbook became my way of um, giving myself the permission to spend time at a location. You know, mm -hmm. like when you're new somewhere and you don't know anybody and nobody uh, resembles pe the people from your part of the world, uh, you're not very comfortable. And the sketchbook became my uh, crutch to be more comfortable in public spaces, to give yeah. me a quote unquote reason to sit in the cafe for an hour with my coffee and just look at people. And it fed my curiosity about my world and it became a form of creative expression. And as a result, it was something I wanted to keep doing. And this, just this thing, just this finding a way to keep doing it every day and spurring it with my curiosity as an artist, as an immigrant, as an observer, as a writer. Um, I think that's the, the path to follow and it leads to what people call style, what people call your distinct voice. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I've been able to strike upon a style, which is these people that you see around me, the way that I draw them from a combination of a lot of the things that uh, are interesting to me and a lot of the ways that I work and a lot of the things that I just cannot do. Like I'm a very impatient person, so I can't draw for two hours. I have to draw more quickly. And that is, you know, very manifest in every single thing I draw. Yeah. Oh, I love that you followed sort of your creative thread and that that artist out of curiosity, um, Nina, in the comments um, pulled out, too, is just such a beautiful reflection on how a sketchbook can can help encourage that observation and give us permission to sort of be in a space and whether it's permission for ourselves and other people having a thoughts of, oh, that person's up to something. <laughs> and I, I find when I travel, my impulse to draw can be more. But then at home, too, my sketchbook can drive me to see things differently, too. And so to go out, whether in some place more familiar or more foreign, the, the sketchbook, my sketchbook can really open my eyes to um, discover new things. And, yeah, and you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when, when we travel, it's so easy to be curious about even commonplace things. But when we're at home, so to speak, or the city you live in, it's uh, it's more easy to uh, look past things to just not pay attention to your world, uh, the minutia of your world. But a sketchbook is this antidote to this, you know, this this way that we are sort of living now, you know, with our phones and our instant distractions. The idea of sitting somewhere and looking at just ordinary people or just a tree, you know, my part of the world is filled with beautiful trees as well, which has been a new observation for me. So I spend time with my sketchbook just looking at a tree every day. And just the gift of time is what a sketchbook gives us. And that is like, I think that's the most precious thing, how you draw and, how, you know, like people often say that I wish I would draw more uh, if I could draw better. And I say that, you know, it has nothing to do, the reason to do it has nothing to do with how well you draw. Like, the the joy you get from drawing is totally separate from whether it was a good drawing or not. Mm -hmm. It's these mm -hmm. these uh, these minutes and these hours that you spend just giving time to something in front of you. I think there's so much there's such a great gift in that, and there's so much mindfulness, and so much we uh, so much that you get from paying attention to your environment. I think it's such a good reason to do it. Mm, oh, I, I agree. And I do see a comment I'll share with you from Michelle saying curiosity seems like a connection between the brain and heart, whereas observation seems more heady, brainy. Do you have any thoughts on that? I, I really I like it. It's, it's a really good thought. It's a really great sentence. Uh, curiosity is does uh, seem to like there is a joy to curiosity. And that joy, I think, is the element of the heart that we feel like at the, at the center of curiosity is doing what you want. Uh, when I left my PhD program, I promised myself that if I was going to take such a big leap of faith in my life, I was, if I was going to change the trajectory of my life so drastically, I had to do exactly what I want. I cannot keep doing things that I don't want. So I've made it my job since then to do, to find what I want to do, to do those things and to make them work for me. I started uh, trying to write a novel. Then I started drawing better comics. Then I started a newsletter and then I started a podcast and none of these things were planned from before. 
only the writing was supposed to happen. Everything else has just come about from chasing curiosity and giving value to my curiosity, like, you know, um, not laughing it away, just actually taking it seriously and giving it worth in my own mind first. And that leads to all these kind of beautiful discoveries, like what you do in the end and how you do it and how you express yourself is almost secondary as long as you get into the habit of doing so. Oh, I couldn't agree more. I always I always give myself my personal goal when I'm out around quantity versus quality, because I just want to mm-hmm. give myself the challenge to do things instead of worrying about the outcome of how you know good or finished something will feel. Um, mm-hmm. Oh, that's that's beautiful. Um, well, Nishant, maybe we could pull up your desk and you can show us some of the tools you use out on your adventures. And I know sure um, we're all excited. Um, you planning to share some ideas to help draw out in spaces from um, observation on site, something you do a lot. And uh, mm-hmm. um, and I'll just mention we have people from around the world have loved seeing um, everyone commenting where you're from, from Brooklyn, New York, to Paris, to Canada, Massachusetts, Ottawa, Australia. So really oh, wow. glad to have you all here. And I'll be keeping an eye on the comments and doing my best to, to mm-hmm. share questions um, as they come. So thank you all for being here. All right, here we go, Nishant, got your all right. desk so, pulled uh, up. Yeah, here we are. So everything begins for me with uh, the fountain pen. Um, this is the fountain pen I've used for the last six years. I use it, I've used it nearly every day in that time. This is a Lamy Safari. Uh, Lamy is a German brand, and this is an entry-level fountain pen, very popular in urban sketching circles. Uh, the Lamy Safari with a fine nib in this case, uh, but I've been using it every day for six years, so I think I have uh, made this nib into a broad nib, so it, le- <laughs> it puts down a lot more ink than it used to, or that a new fine nib would. Um, my standard working tool is literally just this and one sketchbook that I can carry in my jacket pocket and maybe one more pen, either a black marker or a brown marker. Uh, The brown marker, since I started using these brown paper sketchbooks. So I started using these sketchbooks in which the paper is toned and that lets me uh, play around a little bit. I've been putting brown colors, I've been putting whites to show highlights. Um, and it's, it's, it's like thinking of the page as the mid tone and you can go towards light and you can also go towards dark. So not just the black ink, but I've also started using brown and a white marker as well. Um, of late though, uh, I've pushed myself towards more color. So just last year, I started using these brown paper sketchbooks and what they've done for me, because before this, I only used to work with something like this something uh, just uh, black and white, uh, I mean, black ink on white paper and what, uh, and draw like this. So what the brown paper has done for me is it's helped me to introduce color into my work. It's made it just a little easier because to me, the brown paper feels like it's already the first layer of color on the page. And Mm -hmm. now I just have to add the second and third and that makes it just get the ball rolling. So I've been playing around. I've gotten a few more inks recently. I got a very beautiful uh, reddish ink. Uh, this is a Japanese brand called Tag. Um, otherwise, I use for my black, I use carbon ink from Platinum. This is the mm-hmm. darkest black ink that I've been able to find. And I really, really love it. It's also waterproof. Yeah. And the 60cc yeah. really lasts a very long time. As a daily user, this will last me all year, I think. Almost the whole year. So it's really worth it. Oh, but, I love uh, Off late, I... Mm-hmm. Yeah, and off late, I've been using a few more things. Uh, I've been using some Posca markers because I started with the white Posca marker on my brown pages and I expanded to the pink and the blue and I've got a whole bunch. But um, the basic approach whenever I go out to draw is that I don't want to carry too many things. I don't want to have decision paralysis and I don't want to spend time thinking about color theory. It is not natural for me to think that way and I waste a lot of time and energy. So I only go with maybe three colors, maybe two colors, and I'll pick them randomly and I'll try to make them work when I'm outdoors. I I don't know what I'm going to find. I don't have an idea of my subjects already, but I use my colors as a way to prompt me to think about what is in front of me and to think about it in creative ways. Another addition to my art supply kit recently are these Karandash color pencils. I bought us, I didn't buy the whole set. I just bought these five 
uh, I picked them out of the in the store and I just thought they seemed like a complete set. An interesting palette to work inside and I've been trying to do creative things within that. So when I show more of my sketchbook, I'll talk about how I'm using these limited colors to to quote unquote paint my landscape. It's not really painting, but my trusty tool is always an ink pen, preferably the Lamy of late, also the Kaviko Sport. So mm -hmm. this is, um, let me see, yeah, here it is. So this is the Kaviko, uh, and it is a brass pen. There's all, they also have the plastic one, but this is the brass one. So it's just a little bit heavier, and I like how it sits in my hand. It's a very small pen also, so it's very easy to carry it with you. It's really tiny. <laughs> um, so this is this is sort of what I take with me in my bag. Uh, when I go out to draw, you I just would, have a question you know, of um, who makes your your tone sketchbook, and um, I'll uh, I'll see if we can get a nice list from you at the end that we'll post in the description um, after the demo. So everyone looking yeah. to if you've missed anything, we'll uh, we'll try and get it all posted. Yeah, sure thing. So uh, this is my own logo. This is not the logo of the brand. <laughs> I just put a sticker of my own. The sketchbooks I'm using are by Stillman and Burn. The brown paper is called the Nova series. I really like it a lot. I have it in this size, which is, you know, it just fits in the palm of my hand. I can draw like this. I can be standing somewhere and I can draw in it. Let's, yeah, this is in Seattle uh, in the university campus. So I was able to stand, hold it in my left hand and draw with my right hand. I didn't need to rest it somewhere. And that is very convenient to me. It helps me make quick drawings. The reason for this, the ideas behind this workshop today are also around the idea of a uh, quick drawing, like how to find something that's interesting to you and to, to jump on it, to draw it within a few minutes. This was uh, last month on the Paths train in New York. And I drew this in between stations. So this was maybe like a five minute ride uh, across the Hudson in which I drew uh, all of these people. The way that I draw, the idea is that I want to seize these transient moments, these moments that are maybe in our world for five, 10 minutes, when we're on a bus, when we're on a train, when we're waiting in line somewhere, maybe when we're waiting for our food at a restaurant, um, to be able to seize these moments and to make something out of it. The, those are the points of my of my technique that I'll be sharing today and that are also the subject of my next workshop. Um, Doing quick drawings is a really good way to go by instinct, which is very important to me, which is just my temperament, how I work. So I'll be talking about that a bit as well. But so as you see, these drawings, uh, I've used the I've used the red ink, which is in this pen. I've used black, which is in this one. So these two, and I had a white uh, jelly roll pen, which is somewhere around. Yes, so I have this white jelly roll pen that I use these whites sometimes. If I want a thicker white, then I use my Posca marker, which is also very much brighter. It's really mm -hmm. nice how it contrasts on the brown paper. Um, and, and you seem yeah, to have so, a terrific awareness of what to leave out. I really love the use of negative space throughout all of your sketches. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is also just, uh, it's a natural evolution from the way that I am in a public space. I want to finish my drawing quickly. And what I'll be talking about during my demo also is how to focus on the thing that you want to draw, the action, the subject of your drawing, and how to uh, let everything else go out of focus. And doing so not only as a way to save time and to finish your drawing, but also as a way to help your viewer. Because I feel like this makes for more focused art. It brings attention to the thing that I want you to look at. And I'm able to use the negative space also to give relevance to the busy lines that are inside here. You know, mm -hmm. you only notice something is busy if it's in contrast to a space that is not busy. And because I work so much just in lines and not colors otherwise, I have to alternate between areas of busyness and areas of emptiness in order to create contrast, in order to create a, like a flow of attention across the page. How you see this page is something I think about. Uh, I used to draw a lot of comics, so all comic artists have to think about how the viewer's eyes will travel over their page. Mm. And that is something that comes into my art, even if I'm thinking of just one page, this is like one panel that I made. And I'm conscious of how, how a page is scanned and the order in which I want things to be there, where I want my important things to be, where I want less, where less important things can be, where I don't need to pay attention. 
I've just sort of imbibed ideas, you know, like I don't have training in art, so I don't know uh, explicitly how I do these things, but there is a bit of ideas like uh, breaking your page into a three by three grid and thinking of your focal points, the nodes that you create. Uh, I think about other framing ideas of how uh, I can use objects in my scene. This was drawn on the train in New York and it is super shaky. You can see my lines are super <laughs> shaky as well. This is one long line that I tried to make straight, but here we are. Um, I think about how I can use objects in my scene to frame my subject. So this window for this person, this poster behind for this person, and yeah. how these two sit in the middle of my page and uh, draw attention towards my subject. So there are these very subliminal messages and tricks <laughs> that you can play with framing, how you use uh, foliage. Foliage is notoriously difficult to draw if you're drawing with lines. It's a lot of work and I don't have the patience for it. So I do creative things to suggest what is there, but I don't try to, I don't waste time drawing something that I don't care to go into details with. Something that is not quote unquote part of the reason why I'm drawing this scene. The reason why I drew this scene was that I saw this person with a bunch of free books because somebody here was giving away free books. Uh, she was flipping through them and having lunch, and I thought this was such a beautiful moment, and I wanted to capture just the energy of Washington Square Park. And after thinking this out, I had to represent it abstractedly with this page, think about the things that are important to my drawing and the things that are less and less important to my drawing. And the things that are less important become uh, decorations around the things that are important. So that's what I'm going to talk about when I demo now. It's also uh, very important when you want to think about uh, how to start, you have to know where to start when you want to draw within five minutes. When you want to draw within five minutes, you also really have to know how to finish. So both mm -hmm. of these things are, they flow with each other and uh, you can begin a drawing and finish a drawing within five minutes without even knowing if you have three minutes or four minutes or five minutes. And this is what leads to really diving in with curiosity not allowing hesitation to stop you and to explore your curiosity, even in spaces where you previously did not think you had enough time to make a drawing. Yeah. Yeah. Finding those little moments in between. And I, I often remind myself too, that confident marks are more important on, or stand on a page more um, than accurate marks. And so in making a drawing, if you can approach it just with confidence of, of the choices you're making. Oh, absolutely. That is such a great line, actually. Uh, it's something I talked about in my newsletter recently, the difference between accuracy and precision. Mm. Um, accuracy being ex how exactly correct your line is. So how close to realism maybe your uh, drawings are. And precision is how consistent your lines are. So even if you're wrong in the same way every time, and the more consistent you are, the more precise you are, the closer you are to what people call your style. And I have... Uh, just by drawing more and more and more, I have come to the way that I like to draw. There is a way that my lines look with the confidence strokes. And I think that is what uh, people refer to when they say that I have a specific style of art. Oh, well, I'm already inspired, Nishant. <laughs> and um, <laughs> yeah, you, you've prepared a, a few things for us. The link is in um, the description. If anyone doesn't have it, you put together some reference images. So I've got mine yeah. printed out in front of me. I uh, look forward to following along here. Excellent. I think it's time to draw. I, I think I've talked quite a bit. And <laughs> uh... I wish we could all be out together in a square full of people, but thank you for, for making it possible. <laughs> Oh, yes. So how I typically do it in when I do Zoom workshops with my readers uh, of my newsletter, I do a monthly Zoom hangout in which I draw for them and I answer questions. Um, I show them the reference file and I ask them if there is a specific drawing they want me to make. So do you think we could get somebody in the comments to uh, nominate a, a page of that PDF, which one they'd like me to draw right now? Oh, that's a terrific question. Anyone watching, if you um, are checking out the reference photo, post a comment. Um, I'm looking through and the, the first one here, I'll pull up my screen and can hold these up. Um, uh, first one is this, this looks like like a poker game or something here. Uh -huh. um, and then what do we have next? Um, and then there's this beautiful image of a potter. That's just gorgeous. Looks like it could already just be a painting. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then, oh, this might be, this might be my vote. I love this. It looks like a train station or something. People hanging out with a bunch of luggage. And yeah. then, did you give us one more? You gave us a nice generous, oh, oh, this is another hard choice. So it looks like a train. Yeah. Um, this, is a, this is the local train. These are the city commuter trains in Mumbai in India. Wow. They are notoriously jam-packed. And this photo, I think, is when they are not very busy. This looks quite empty compared to how they can be sometimes. <laughs> All right. Well, we've got one vote for the suitcase one and another right. vote for the potter. Um, so let's see here. Maybe we can see what there's time for. If we could start with the suitcase, let's, Nishant, and then... Um, yeah, let's do both. Um, we can do both. Great. We've got a couple others I'll voting. Oh, both both the potter and um, the... Um, the the train station are getting getting the votes there so excellent oh. <laughs> so um so all right let's start with the let's start with the train station and then we'll do the portal all right so okay everybody can see my page uh i'm drawing with my lamy safari and usually uh so I'll, I'll talk about this in a lot more detail in my workshop uh how i how i go about this it's largely a two-step process with a lot of micro steps in between, but I begin from a point of interest. So the first job of the artist is not to draw, the first job is to see. You have to see in what is in front of you and you have to analyze it for what you like, what attracts you. Even if you can't say why, you have to have a reason to start at a certain point. So in this case, I'm going to start this with the lady with the blue suitcase. Uh, she's right in the middle of our scene and she's on the phone and she's frantically trying to change her bookings maybe. So mm -hmm. I'm going to start with her and I'm going to use a lot of uh, long lines. So my drawing style is full of long lines because uh, I uh, when you are drawing things that are liable to change when you're drawing out in a public space, you have to really very quickly capture the essentials of what you're trying to draw because the posture of the person might change or they might just get up and leave and you never know when your time runs out. So drawing long lines has been a way for me to, uh, to, to see shapes better, to capture dynamic moments better before they change. Like even if this person were to change their posture within a minute of me starting to draw, I think I already have the details I need and if they were to change their posture right now, it would not hurt my drawing at all. So when you say long you, lines, you mean you leave your pen on your paper, like following the contour. Right. So yeah, that's right. I follow the contours and I follow the contours, not, uh, you know, not uh, object by object. So it's not like I draw the head first and then I draw the torso. I follow the lines just wherever they take me. And that means sometimes drawing things in an apparently random order. So you'll see that now. I'm going to just try to follow with instinct how I feel like drawing this scene. And I'm imagining that I'm drawing this in a physical uh, railway station, so I do not know then any of these people might leave. So I don't know when my sub, my whole scene will change completely. So I have to dive upon the things that I really, really want to get down, the things that I want uh, that are the point of this drawing. I love the contour approach. It's sort of freeing, just focusing on the shapes. I, I know sometimes I'll just do contours, uh, continuous contour also mm -hmm. to give myself permission to, to let go of some of that urge for accuracy, I guess, coming back to your, your point about- Absolutely, yeah. Versus, um, oh, oh, help me with the other word here. <laughs> accuracy. <laughs> yeah, for, precision versus accuracy. You're absolutely right. Like I- A bit uh, of a mind shift, uh-huh. Yeah, so I, I I talk about this as well, like in pretty much the same words you use. The idea is that, you know, you have to uh, start to follow these lines and not get lost in the, like, uh, let me try to rephrase this. You have to draw what is in front of you without recognizing it for what it is. Mm. So the moment you are consciously aware that you're drawing somebody's face, the trouble is that you your head is going to throw up all the images of all the drawn faces that you have seen in your life right from Michelangelo onwards. And instantly, you will not be drawing the face in front of you. You will be drawing the faces in your head that are telling you what a face looks like. 
So uh, drawing contour lines is a way to almost stop seeing the object in the way that you recognize it. When you just follow these lines and sometimes you jump from one object to another, you don't really complete one before going to the going to another shape. What happens is you stop recognizing these objects. You just see the lines as they are appearing in front of you. Which makes the job of drawing perspective so easy. You don't even see the problem. You just see the line and your job is just to follow the line. So from here, I can very easily come down to this other person. And suppose they were in this pose right now and I wanted to capture them quickly before they were gone, before they changed. I have to get down the essentials of this pose before they change it. We've got a question um, from Carola of, do you enjoy drawing in a quiet setting or among the hustle bustle? I definitely love the hustle bustle. I grew up in a very busy part of the world. Uh, places that are too quiet are suspicious to me. I feel uncomfortable. Uh, sometimes, like I, especially in public spaces, I like it to be crowded because I love the idea that uh, I like this is sort of what sneaky art is based on. I like the idea of being around a lot of activity and getting away with a drawing. Um, and a busy space is a space where you can blend in very comfortably. You don't have to think about uh, like people. Uh, looking at you and a lot of artists who draw out uh, who are trying to draw outdoors you know they they get caught up in the idea that people can see me and I don't want uh, I don't want to be seen doing this silly thing in public and uh, I think crowded places are a gift crowded places are filled with people who are just so busy in their lives that they don't see you do anything and I drew at Grand Central Terminal in New York earlier this summer and it was amazing because hundreds of thousands of people walk, must have walked by in the hour and a half that I was there and nobody had the time to, you know, think about what I was doing. And I notice you're very aware of the um, values of, of coloring in some of those nice darks as you work mm -hmm. too. And you're just taking advantage yeah. of those in the moment, not going back. I suppose. Yeah, this is, this is very <laughs> instinctive because I'm trying to think about uh, what are the different ways that I can segregate spaces if I'm working and, you know, because I do so much of my work just with one uh, ink color, what are the ways that I can show depth and I can show detail without overwhelming the audience, without uh, getting them too lost in the lines, without myself getting too lost in the lines. And the way that I've found to do this is to play with uh, contrast. Contrast is uh, tells you how val how important something is, how much attention to pay to something, how much uh, how to think about things in relation to one another. Uh, and a lot of what I've learned to draw has been from comic books. And comic books, I think, are an excellent learning resource for something like this. Uh, I like to tell people that every comic book page, every single page of every comic book in the world is an excellent lesson in how to economize information on the page. The mm -hmm. point of view that the artist chose, the colors that they chose, the things that they put in that panel were all designed for a reader who probably has half a second for it before they go to the next page, before they turn to the next thing. So every comic book page is an excellent lesson in how to economize and how to frame and how to, how to say more than just the word bubble. So I've learned a lot from just looking at comic book pages and I advise people to do the same. Um, this would be sort of where I would look at this drawing now and I would go back to some of my other portions. I would think about where are the places I want to add contrast and detail? Where do I want to draw more attention? So I could add some shadows. I do this with the reverse side of my nib because it gets me a thinner line. I also add details now that I didn't before that I that are, you know, these details are independent of the person's pose. Even if this person's left by now, it doesn't matter, I can fill this in. And it's I didn't lose time on it before. Uh, these are things that I can do, uh, even if they are replaced by another person, I can still study them for how the shadows lie, uh, where the shadows are, where the highlights are. Another person can fill in for them and help me fill this space in. Um, and if, you know, if I don't have time, if suppose I'm pulled away right now, this is my finished drawing. But if I have a couple more minutes, then I have a couple more minutes to add some details. All the important things of this drawing are done. 
the only thing that's left to do is dependent on how much time do I have in this moment if I'm drawing outdoors. I love I love that you're aware of the priorities of getting those those big shapes, big figures, and then what you can come back and fill in. So mm -hmm. taking advantage of those moments. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I this is something that I've just learned uh, because of putting myself in this situation. Uh, then I just started to draw with a sketchbook. I would sit at corner cafes. I would look out at the traffic light, and I would try to draw. Uh, all the people that stopped at the traffic light, even if they were there for, like at a traffic light, you usually have a person for maybe 15 seconds, maybe 20 seconds. If you're lucky, you have 30 seconds with them. And I I just set myself this challenge that I would draw uh, whoever passed by and try to see how quickly I can capture the human form. And putting myself through this exercise, making a lot of bad mistakes uh, in the process, Putting myself through this exercise led to developing these specific skills. All right, I see you're starting our our Potter. You know, it um, reminds me I, when I've worked with students. Um, I'll sometimes, you know, I, I personally I love gesture sketching or, but going through the exercise of what can you do in like ten seconds, thirty seconds, mm -hmm. or two minutes, and sort of building your own understanding of what's a 30 second drawing versus a two minute. And I, I think I'm constantly impressed with what can be done very quickly when you just give yourself permission to do it. And I, I just, I see how much you're capturing in just a few seconds. <laughs> permission is the, the golden word. You've got it right there. Like, I think uh, people are capable of so much more, uh, but we don't give ourselves the permission to do it because we are constantly filled with these ideas of uh, what a good drawing looks like. And if I cannot do it, then I should not quote unquote waste my time or waste my tools in making a bad drawing. I think these are such unnecessary harmful ideas that we carry. I carried them for years and years and shedding them has been so important to, you know, letting, like even I would go so far as to say to give myself permission to become an artist. I had to let go of those stupid ideas. Oh, this fellow has such a terrific contour of his face and beard. Mm -hmm. And I'm enjoying all this pottery and the glass. Like these are very interesting. And even the table is actually quite interesting now that I look at it. So many of my drawings, you know, when I'm drawing out in uh, like at the cafe or something, they start with because of one thing that I saw. And over the course of drawing it, I realized that I'm seeing so many more things suddenly that I didn't notice at first that add more and more beauty to this moment. So drawing has really become like a, a vehicle for me to discover something beautiful, you know, even in the most, so to say, ordinary places. You typically draw on the same or similar scale. I know you showed us a number of the, the smaller sketchbooks. Mm -hmm. um, or do you occasionally pull out something really big or big markers or you find this is where you what the tools and size that really resonate for you? Well, the practice, uh, I, I come back to the title of sneaky art. <laughs> I'm very conscious of, uh, you know, uh, how inconspicuous I am. And I am also an impatient person. So those two things combine to make me more biased towards smaller sketchbooks. I don't want to be very conspicuous in my public space. I don't want to take too much time with my drawing. Therefore, I draw with something that is handheld and smaller. And I have drawn occasionally bigger, especially on commission, on location. But um, I find my comfort is in a drawing that I can finish in 45 minutes to one hour. I think that leaves me energized and it makes me feel really good about my day. And I'm able to capture all the things that I want to capture in that time. So as a result, my sketchbooks tend to be smaller. I do not, however, advocate uh, any kind of loyalty to a brand. Like I change my brand as often as I can. I change the dimensions of the sketchbook as often as I can. So uh, the current sketchbook I'm using is this one, which is a square uh, from SMLT Art. This is a new brand that I've discovered. I'm really enjoying it. So. 
uh, these pages are super bright and super nice. I started drawing this way on them, but then I realized that what I really want to do is spread, uh, hold it vertically, standing, or hold it horizontally somewhere. This is another vertical drawing. I did this with my Karandash color pencils and ink. And I tried to, I'm trying to find a way to get these two media to merge together and see where they can add value. This was done just with pencil. This year I also started using pencils. So this is a single black wing pencil that I used for this whole page. And drawing this kind like at, at a one is to two ratio is also super interesting. I was able to sit down to make this drawing, hence all the details in it. But sometimes this is um, the journey of a breakfast, of a brunch, from standing in line to finding a table and our neighbors to finally eating. And mm. over the course of one spread, to be able to tell a story like that, again, thinking of how information flows across the page as a comic book almost, um, it's a lot of fun to do this kind of thing, again, with a small page and this awkward dimension, you might think. Other than this, this is a trusted size also, again, because it is handheld. I think this is three and a half by five and a half inches, but a lot of the drawings in this, I drew at Banff National Park with it when I went with parents. This was made standing, uh, and I really wanted to show the white and the emerald color of the, the waterfall and the river. So. Uh, I tried to create contrast for color and non-color spaces for busy areas and empty spaces so that everything can be appreciated in its own way. There are a lot of people in my drawings, always, even if it is about nature. I really enjoy human activity. That is what interests me if ever I go to draw. So I always look for what the people are doing. And we've got a question um, of the water of the pencils you use are watercolor. And oh, I love those bold blues there. <laughs> mm -hmm. The pencils I use, uh, I have never tried watercolor around them. I'm not sure. I think they are watercolor proof because they have this little symbol here. Either this makes it water soluble or waterproof. So I don't know if this is really good or really bad. Maybe it makes them water soluble and they can be used as a as a wash, as a color wash. I think that's what they are. So they're definitely not resistant to water. Um, in the inks that I use, platinum carbon is resistant. It's waterproof. It's super good. It takes a little bit of time to dry on your page. So you have to have patience, which I don't have. So I don't use uh, the, That's the reason I don't use watercolors, by the way. I just don't have the patience to wait for the colors to dry on my page before I add another layer. We've got a so question. A lot if you enjoy sketching to music ever too, or are you just out taking in the world? Um, well, I first, I'll, that there are two answers here. I love to draw at concerts. I always love to draw at a music show, whether it's a jazz show, whether it's a concert in which there's only standing room. Let me see if I have something here. Maybe not recently, it has been a while, but I love to draw at shows, but at the same time, when I draw outdoors, if I'm drawing in a public space like this, I am not listening to music. I have made a very conscious decision that I will, uh, it's, I find it disrespectful both to the act of being in, a, in an urban space, in a public space, and also disrespectful to the music at the same time. I love music. It's a really big part of my life and I will give it attention when I listen to it. I don't want to treat it as a soundtrack and I don't want to use it as a mood adjuster. So part of my drawing exercise is that I'm trying to be more mindful and present in my environment. And that means to really, really be there and not to put myself in a sound bubble, you know, so to speak. So no music when I'm drawing outdoors. I want to hear the sounds of the people. I want to overhear conversations if I'm at a cafe. I want to be in the place that I am, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love those little narratives you're finding and all those in-between moments, like you mentioned, of waiting for the cafe or waiting for your table. That's, I think those yes. are the times when you have a small sketchbook just invites, um, invites sketching. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, I think it. I make it as easy for myself as I can, you know, so I can always carry this. It's so small. And if I have a jacket, it will always fit in any jacket's pocket. I have one pen, same size, again, very easy to carry. If my basic work can be done with this much, 
I have no reason to think that I cannot make a drawing right now wherever I am. So I make it very simple and I don't allow a space for hesitations. Now, if I thought that any drawing I make has to have watercolors or it has to be nine by 12 inches, then I'm immediately cutting out so many occasions. Like I would never draw at Banff. I would never draw this waterfall. I would never draw that lake because I would never have the time. I went with parents and we were seeing a lot of things at that time. And I could not have asked for more than half an hour of their time when I was here. So uh, drawing with limited tools, drawing in a small sketchbook helps me draw things that I would not otherwise draw. Well, I wonder if we have just enough time where you might tackle one more um, yeah. sketch with us. <laughs> Let's do it. Yes. Which one should we do? Um, I think some folks were interested in the, um, the train, the busy train. Yeah, okay. Sure thing. So let me talk about a couple more things that I often that I will definitely be talking about in my upcoming workshop. Um, the, this is that when you are uh, how to start and how to finish a sketch. So in order to start, you have to have a focal point to your art, the thing that you want to draw. Now, looking at this drawing, you might pick one subject or the other. In this case, I will pick the person with uh, earphones looking down at presumably their phone in their hand. So the second person from the left as my subject, which means I want to begin from them. It also means that I want to draw everything with respect to them. Uh, they will set the proportion for the rest of the page. They will also set a sense of how detailed everything else will be because this is where the focus should be. This is how I start. How I finish will be a factor of uh, how my page balances. I want to get to the point where it can look finished as quickly as possible and then add details afterwards. So I'm going to do this really quickly. Let's I'll try to finish this in like the next two minutes or so. Let's see if I can do it. Just following the shapes, not thinking about uh, whether it's the head or the jaw or something else that I'm drawing, just really think just looking at the lines and going with them. I think one of my takeaways from hanging out with you today, Nishant, is going to be mm -hmm. that description of long lines. I love that that term for. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> it's really a beautiful I, way to. I'll give it you, on. I'll give you another reason to draw long lines. So you know, when I uh, one of the things I teach in my workshop is that if you can write by hand, if you can form letters and you know how to write the alphabet, then you also know how to draw, because writing and drawing are literally exactly the same thing. In both of those things, we take uh, lines and shapes, which are just combinations of lines, and we put them in combinations of each other, and then they mean things. And that is the same thing we're trying to do with drawings. We're using lines and combinations of lines to give meaning to what we see around us. So if you know how to draw the alphabet, you have a command over a lot of basic shapes, which are actually all you need in order to be able to functionally draw. So long lines, long lines come into this because uh, if you were to try to write like somebody, you would try to write, have the same effect they have, but you would not try to write literally with their handwriting. You might want to write with their words, but not with their handwriting. And long lines are your handwriting. How you make a long line, whether it shivers a little, whether, you know, whether it 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 is, absolutely strong and confident and flat, whether it bends a little when you try to draw it. So something like how consistent is this shape for you? All of this is distinct to you. Nobody else would draw it like you. And a long line is the easiest way to draw like yourself. Oh, that's a beautiful, beautiful reflection. So as I move away from my subject, uh, I am less interested in other things, I don't want them to steal attention away from my subject. My subject gets all the details that I can give him, all the shadows that I can look at, all the, the highlights that I can put, whether I can emphasize the Reebok logo on his bag, just all the thinking of the drawing as information. I want to have more information here. And as I spiral out, I will have less and less information for the rest of the page because those things are not the point of my drawing. They are just here to add color. So this person, for example, I might draw him in a single line now. 
just because he is not necessary to the larger point of this drawing. I appreciate how simple you keep your faces too, that um, you're not getting caught up in, in accuracy, but just leaving the shape and a few details. Indeed. I, I think uh, comic books, again, are a very big influence in my life because uh, in this respect, because I am not very curious to do realism. I, it doesn't motivate me at all. I don't see the value in doing something that uh, that well a camera can do better than me i don't want to be in competition with all the technology of the world so uh i try to think about uh again it's information what do i want to tell you about this person maybe the mustache tells you a little bit about gender maybe it tells you a little bit about which part of the world they might be in and that is enough other than that all i need you to know is that there is a person standing holding up the railing with his left hand while looking at his phone and that is the information he's meant to convey, nothing more and nothing less. Anything more would be a waste of my time, would be a waste of also the viewer's time. Sean, you've so given us now, just so many beautiful nuggets to reflect on today. I'm, I'm incredibly inspired. And I know you've mentioned that you have a workshop coming up and um, we've posted uh, in the description to the video and in the chat a bit that you've generously given us an art toolkit coupon code uh, for any students oh, yes. interested in joining your workshop. Um, can you tell us a little bit about other ways we can stay connected with you, Nishant? Sure thing. So um, a few years, like two years ago, I started to communicate myself through a newsletter because I grew really tired of social media and trying to compete on Instagram for attention. And so I've been writing every week. Every week I share what I see of my world, the sneaky art I find in my world. And every week I ask for just five minutes of attention from my readers. At this time, I have uh, more than 10,000 readers. I'm very lucky to have so many people who have let me into their inbox. And I share with them this journey that I'm on, this reflective journey, this self-education journey to be an artist, to be a creative person, to see how it can work, to discover more of my world and to understand it better. So that's something that I really enjoy doing. I think of my Substack audience as my first audience that I think about every time I make a drawing. Other than this, other than the workshop, uh, I mean, other than this, I'm also doing this workshop that I'm super excited about. In this workshop, I'm, it's going to be a two hour long workshop and I will explain the architecture of something like this page right now about how I choose where to start and I move spiral out from it. And how when I'm drawing something that is important, it has a lot of details and things that are less important have just, I have economized for time. So you can see here three levels of detail, at least with the people that I've drawn. There's a primary subject who gets the most amount of details because I want you to look at him. There is the next person who has less detail because he is relevant to the scene. He is forming the architecture of this scene, giving it purpose, but I don't want him to distract from my subject. So less, just the mustache, just the hair, a sense of his bag and his posture and his clothes and his activity. And then even further back, people who are less and less important to the scene. So not no not too much detail in clothing no details of the face this way i'm saving time but i'm also retaining focus so that you look where i want you to look here's something i do at the end of all my drawings uh, i give a frame to my subject just to set them just to help them pop out of the page a little bit just to help differentiate them from the middle ground and the background even in a busy page so details less details busy areas let's make it busier busy areas less busy areas white space not white space all of this contrast creates a journey and it makes an experience for your subject uh, for your viewer but it's also your journey like your curiosity comes into this because you will think about what is it that you want to show what is it that you don't want to show what is it that is important to you what is not important to you these this practice can only be done outdoors, can only be done from real observation of your environment, because you have to look at the 3D complexity of our world and then make it your job to simplify, to filter it, 
So part of the artist's job is to make their own filter. What is it that you like? What is it that you don't? What is it that you like to draw? What is it that you don't like to draw? And then understand what, uh, how best you can express yourself, how best you can express what you see on this page that you get. So here's how I would make this drawing. This is the least detail. So I have three levels of detail with my subject. Uh, I, if I were to draw somebody even further back, I would draw them with the reverse side of the nib because that will make the lines even thinner and help set them to the background. Uh, the closer things are, the thicker the lines become, the more the details, and the further away they are, the less the details, the thinner the lines. Again, saves time as well as gives a sense of depth to what would otherwise be just a flat page. Oh, and you've really broken down a scene that at first glance and looking at that photo is so complicated and, and distilled it into, into a, a, a drawing that we can explore and, and understand with, with mm -hmm. depth and, and focus. Um, well, well, Nisha, this has just flown by. It's been such a <laughs> pleasure. I'll, I'll pull us up again, but I just so appreciate your time and energy to um, share with our art toolkit community. Um, Absolutely. If you are, are, are new here, we have a whole archive of our live demos. This will be available, the recording afterwards. And um, again, we'll be posting some more to the description of this so you can um, follow up on some notes of other ways to stay connected with Nishant and supplies. And, and Nishant, I just want to thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I enjoyed this and I've loved the questions that people have fielded. Um, everyone is also free to email me and ask me more questions. The, you can find the workshop link as well. And there is a special discount for everybody who has given me their time today. I'm so grateful that people would find an hour in the middle of a beautiful day, at least in this part of the world. It's a beautiful day today. And you're here sitting at a desk and listening to me. I'm really grateful <laughs> for that. Fun to have some fun too. <laughs> All right. Can can you can you bring that a little closer? I'd love to see. Oh that. sure. I mean, oh, it's this is so good. Because I wanted to to um, oh, watch yeah. everything you're doing, but this has been great fun. <laughs> oh, I love it. This is yeah. wonderful. And anyone yeah. else who's watched, if you want to post to Instagram, you can tag us. We'd love to see what you you've done or Facebook. Um, it's just such a joy to share and I'm so grateful for this, this big creative community. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, wonderful, everybody. Well, enjoy the rest of your day.